Hello and welcome to Storehouse Seven Ministries with me, Chris Wickland. Today we're working through Revelation and we're working on part three of Revelation 14. So uh, from verses 12 to 13, it says, Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit so that they may rest from their labours, from for their deeds follow them. Now, in these two verses, we have some interesting language going on here. We have a voice who is narrating out this section, which we can see is the Holy Spirit himself talking, as verse 13 tells us. We also have an encouragement of sorts from God that, although this time will indeed be hard, to have steadfastness and persevere and keep the faith. Verse 14 gives us a strange saying from the Holy Spirit. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Now, I don't know about you, but I find the language odd here as it states, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Why doesn't it say blessed are the saints or believers who die in the Lord from now on? I guess we can only take the passage at face value and state that the dead in Christ are blessed. And this does not imply cursed are those alive. I guess it's God's way of encouraging the church to keep on keeping on and understand that those who have died in the faith are actually very blessed and have great rewards to follow. Don't get broken with grief over the dead for the time of the end is short and you'll see them again very soon when Jesus returns. Maybe this verse is an encouragement for the future church to hang in there despite the pain and loss and know that the dead are greatly blessed of God. Uh, We also need to note that from here on in, we come to the final judgments of God upon the earth and the return of Christ is now imminent. So from chapter 15 onward, that's the next chapter, the final showdown is about to commence to usher in the messianic kingdom of God upon the earth from Mount Zion. Revelation 14, 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now here we have language reminiscent of several Old Testament prophecies. This is either Jesus or an angel getting ready to commence the day of the Lord, the final judgment upon the earth. This verse in Revelation is very similar to another passage from the book of Daniel. Let's take a look at Daniel 7 verses 13 to 14 which reads, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion, glory and the kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. However, because the context of the passage from Revelation 14 has been about angels, it's possible that this passage is not so much about Jesus, but a very important crowned angel. For we know uh, from the teachings of Jesus that the angels are the reapers. And it is clear from verses 14 to 19 that this is about reaping. Although Jesus here could be depicted as being uh, in oversight of all the reaping angels, which I suspect it probably is what it's about. And some may possibly try to insert another rapture theory at this point, stating the angels are gathering the righteous. However, these angels are gathering grapes to be crushed in judgment. See verses 18 and 19 of Revelation 14. Also, in all of Jesus's parables, <coughs> excuse me, it's never the righteous being removed from the wicked. wicked. I want you to think about that. Think of all the parables that Jesus speaks about, you know, where he is separating the wheat from the chaff or the or the dragnet where, you know, the bad fish are being separated from the good. It's always the wicked that are being removed from the righteous, not the righteous being removed from the wicked, which is what the modern day rapture theory teaches. So let's take the parable of the wheat and tares as an example here. Matthew 13, 30, It says, allow both the wheat and tares to grow together until the harvest, i.e. the end of the age. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, that's the angels, first gather up the tares, not the wheat, and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. 
If we move on to verses 40 to 43, which says, So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So we can clearly see from this parable and from these teachings of Jesus that the wicked are always removed from the righteous, not vice versa, which rapture theory propagates. The righteous are never removed from the wicked, rather the wicked are removed from the righteous, and it's them that are removed to be destroyed. Moving on, so if we go now to Revelation 14, verses 15 to 16, and another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now the language of verses 14 to 16 is subtly different from the upcoming verses of 17 to 19, but they both still denote the same thing. The first three verses talk about harvest, whereas the next three talk about clusters of grapes. Again, some may uh, still try to interject a rapture of sorts here, even though it breaks Jesus' teaching of the wicked being separated from the righteous, not the righteous being separated from the wicked, which is what rapture theory teaches, which is completely inconsistent with Jesus' teachings. So let's read on, and then I'll point us also to some Old Testament passages that will clear up these six verses as being a form of dual poetry confirming each other. So in Revelation 14, let's look at verses 17 to 19. It says, And another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So let's take a look at some Old Testament scriptures to unpack this double or dual poetry of verses 14 to 16, which talks about harvest, and then 17 to 19, which talks about reaping clusters of grapes. In Joel 3, verses 2 to 12, there is a gathering of nations that are to be judged for their wickedness towards the Jewish people. Let's read verses 13 and 14 of Joel 3. Put in the sickle, again, same language, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now, you may have noticed the word harvest in this passage, as well as the word wine press, i.e. a place to crush the grapes. This one passage um, links up the dual poetry of Revelation 14 verses 14 to 19. Now some may like to contend with this but the golden rule here is that Revelation can only be taken in light and context of Old Testament apocalyptic prophecy. Revelation has, as I've said multiple times throughout this commentary, it has over 400 references back out of itself to the Old Testament. The language of Revelation was always linking itself to Old Testament apocalyptic prophecy. So to, excuse me, so to group and interpret the book, sorry, beg his beg, I can't even read my, my own handwriting, what's wrong with me? So to grasp, rather, not grope or whatever I just said, so to grasp and interpret the book of Revelation, we must always be asking, where has this phrase or this idea appeared before in the Old Testament? And we must always be asking that question when studying the book of Revelation. You see, without this approach, many errors of thought will creep in. Because Revelation must harmonise with the Old Testament, and it does so beautifully. And as I've always and consistently said, to understand the book of Revelation, the Old Testament is the cipher key that interprets the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is also a cipher key that helps us unlock even more understanding from Old Testament apocalyptic uh, references. 
So let's look at another scripture now in respect to this whole crushing of grapes and harvest. So we turn to Isaiah 63 and we look at verses 1 to 6. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colours from Bosra, marching in the greatness of his strength? Forgive my phone, it's going off again as always. You know, every time I do these talks, no one phones, sorry, no one ever phones me, no one texts me anything. As soon as, I, as soon as I get to one of these talks, it starts going off. Sorry. Isaiah 63 verses 1-6. Who is this who comes from Eden with garments of glowing colours from Bosra, marching in the greatness of his strength? It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garment and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption has come. I looked and there was no one to help and I was astonished and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought to salvation to me and my wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk in my wrath and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. So again, we can also see that harvest is also a sign of judgment in the Old Testament scriptures. This one's taken from Jeremiah 51, 33. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. At the time it was stamped firm, yet in a little while the time of harvest will come for her. So the most important thing we need to remember when uh, trying to decode and decipher the book of Revelation is to find the poetic language, phrasing and apocalyptic imagery back in the Old Testament to understand the language, the context and the meaning of the passage in the book of Revelation. You see, without this cipher, one will end up making some serious errors and read into the text things that shouldn't be read into it. So, you know, the, the, those six verses in Revelation, you know, the first three is talking about harvest, but the second three are talking about the crushing of grapes. Again, I, I have seen this or would I would imagine people going, see, look, there's the harvest. These are the angels that are reaping out the righteous. That's a rapture. And then we have this other harvest and that's the judgment. No, actually, that dual prophecy is saying the same thing twice. And we go back to Old Testament scriptures to find out that harvest is often relinked to judgment as is crushing out of grapes. We must always use the Old Testament as a cipher to understand the new, because if we don't, we will start interpreting things and putting our own ideas in, which are completely and absolutely inconsistent with Old Testament thought. And I... I, I, I guess, you know, I understand why Christians would do this, why they put in and insert these ideas, because it's like, well, we're in the new covenant, you know, the old is gone and all that kind of stuff. But again, that's down to misunderstanding of the nature of the covenant that we're in and a misunderstanding of old and new covenant. Thinking that just because it's old, it's all obsolete and completely useless. But yet the Bible says all scripture is God breathed. And when uh, that was written in 2 Timothy 3.16, you have to ask yourself is, well, there wasn't much script New Testament scripture to go on at the time when that was written. So what scripture is Paul referring to? He's referring to what we call the Old Testament. And so that is very much alive. It's a shame that today many Christians do not spend hardly any time in their Old Testament thinking it to be an outmoded and difficult book, not realizing that a lot of Old Testament prophecy is still to be fulfilled. A lot of the teachings that Jesus taught on comes from the Torah, the Old Testament law, implying that if you're living Jesus's teachings, which comes from the Torah, why are you not then reading the Old Testament law and looking for other things in there that you could apply to your life? Just leave that out there for you. The book, you see, the Bible really is one whole book. It's not two separate books. It's one whole book and it's beautiful in how it all fits together. Let's bring this to a conclusion. Revelation 14 verses 19 to 20. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Now, the phrase outside the city is referring to Jerusalem. 
which likely is the valley of Jehoshaphat, which means God judges, which we've already looked at in Joel 3 earlier in uh, verses 2 and 12. And I'll just read it for you. It says, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them uh, there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. And then to verse 12, let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. So that links all of these phrases and all of these passages that we've now uh, put together. And you can see now how when we look at the book of Revelation and we keep linking it back to the Old Testament, we see how it all just beautifully fits together. And guess what? It makes sense, right? If you, if you don't put the Old Testament and link it to the new, which I would say most Christians don't do that. They don't link the two together. They just read the book of Revelation on its own. And the book of Revelation just seems this really confusing, very scary book. And, you know, people don't get it. And people that do try to work their way through it, that may have some understanding of scripture, or even a large girth of understanding of scripture, may get a lot of things right, but still interject their own opinions and ideas. Now, it's one thing to have opinion. You know, we can all have an opinion. But to interject those opinions as theology is another problem and so where people say well here's a potential rapture there's a rapture you know again as I studied the rapture theology often or not they have to interject I think between five something like between two to five different types of raptures throughout the book of Revelation well there's a rapture of the Christians this is a rapture of the Jews this is a rapture of these people the rapture of those people uh, and I've seen these books where they've actually come up with this stuff and it's basically because if you make an error of thought, especially on the issue of rapture, which we've gone through a lot of times, just to conclude on this, you know, for those maybe listening to this for the first time, it's not that we don't believe in a rapture because the Bible says so, which is in First Thessalonians 4. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the rapture, the gathering together of the saints in the air, is that it, it, is that it, it happens after another event which is the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead is the primary event. And those that are then left alive on the earth are then also then taken up into the air. That's the rapture. So again, all these films where, you know, the left behind type films where people in tracksuit bottoms are just like, you know, a pair of trainers and tracksuit bottoms are left on the floor and everyone's like, oh my gosh, what happened to all these people? That won't be the thing they'll be looking at. They'll be looking at all these skeletons that are coming out of the ground, being resurrected like the Valley of Dry Bones prophecy and fled and sinews coming upon them and these bodies being raised up and becoming these new uh, immortal bodies and then those bodies will be taken up into the air to meet the saints that are coming down with Jesus so they can be reclothed in their human flesh but this time it's purified human flesh it's immortal human flesh in the image of Christ like when he rose again from the dead same type of resurrection body and then they come down onto the earth to rule and to reign with him that is is the rapture that but the bible's very clear that there is only two resurrections from the dead daniel talks about these two resurrections jesus talks about these two resurrections it's mentioned in john it's mentioned in the scriptures it's mentioned in revelation and the first resurrection happens when jesus returns which is in revelation 19 and 20 and then the second resurrection happens at the end of the millennial reign which is the bad resurrection it's all the People that are currently in the underworld now, uh, they raise again to life and uh, back into their normal human bodies. And then they're thrown alive in those human bodies into the lake of fire where they will suffer forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, that is really what the scriptures say. And so if we are adding anything else into that, we are interjecting modern day opinions and ideas into Old Testament ideas. And again, there's an arrogancy with the modern day church in that she thinks, well, they just didn't know that back then. This is our revelation. This is the revelation of the church. But I'm sorry, I must go by the authority of scripture and also the idea that the Old Testament is just as valid today as is the new. And therefore, when the two come together, we have one whole book. And that's why I cannot simply go along with the modern day rapture theory, because I just do not see it anywhere in scripture. I know people will pick on things like, well, what about um, Enoch? He got raptured. And what about um, Elijah? He got raptured. Yes, they did. I totally agree with you. Two people. 
If you're going to base your theology on two people, you know, why did he not get taken? Because he pleased God and God took him. Okay. Um, you're, you're going to end up with some really serious theological ramifications if you try and go down that road, because what you're saying and you're something like, oh, well, that's all Old Testament. They were under law. Well, Elijah was, but Enoch wasn't because there was no law uh, before, you know, in those days. We talk Enoch's like Ray pre pre hit pre flood history. So there was no law given then. So so what's the deal with him? And you start going down these roads, you end up making some weird theology. And again, you just take it off 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 piste. So anyway, off piste being the slope, which you ski down in case anyone thought I swore there. So God bless you. That's enough for today. So God bless you. I hope you've enjoyed uh, chapter 14. And we're moving on to chapter 15, uh, hopefully next week, if not, it'll be the week after. So until then, God bless you all and see you again soon. Bye bye.